I am Dr. Harriet Burge. I'm Director of Aerobiology Research for MLAB PK. I'd like to talk to you a bit about our statistic, the MOLD score, which is a means for interpreting indoor-outdoor ratios. Uh, the interpretation of fungal spore sampling data remains a significant challenge. Most of this is due to the complex and ever-changing uh, outdoor aerosol, that, uh, and there's nothing we can do about that, so we have to learn to work around that. The current state of the art for sampling, in my opinion, is first to develop a hypothesis um, driven visual inspection to look for water damage and visual um, mold growth, visually apparent mold growth. Then follow up if necessary with focused sampling to verify reservoirs and aerosolization from reservoirs. And then finally make decisions based on these data um, uh, with using your personal and professional judgment. Air sampling is generally not required to test most, most hypotheses. However, it's often requested by building owners and occupants, and it's almost always requested by attorneys. However, there's no point in collecting data that you can't interpret. So before you ever collect a single sample, you need to decide in advance how you're going to actually interpret the data. There are a number of different ways of interpreting air sampling data. One is to use absolute numbers. For example, if you have a thousand or more spores per cubic meter indoors, you can say, okay, that's going to constitute a problem environment. This is actually how it was done many years ago. You can look at the types of organisms present indoors, and you can compare the types indoors and outdoors. And if they're the same, and in the same rank order, you can perhaps conclude that there's no problem indoors. Um, you can also compare air sampling data indoors to control data. The control data may be baseline data sets. Maybe you've collected hundreds and hundreds of indoor samples and you've analyzed those samples and you know what's um, likely to be present in clean environments and, not, and uh, moldy environments and you can use that data very nicely. That's a good way to do it. You can use indoor controls. You can sample in areas where you think there is no fungal growth and then in your residence where you think there might be. This is a very, very difficult way of doing it and I don't personally advise it. You can also, and this is very commonly done, use outdoor air as a control. Outdoor air controls can be used in a number of ways. You can look at the indoor compared to the outdoor and say that if the indoor is less than the outdoor, then um, you're okay, the, the building is okay. If it's greater than outdoors, then it's not okay. And so if you're thinking in terms of ratios, you would say if the ratio is less than one, then the indoor um, environment is not a problem. If it's greater than one, then it is a problem. Now, it's a very simplistic approach, uh, but many people do use that method. Next step is to use indoor taxa and compare them to outdoor taxa, or spore types, I should say. Um, and if the spore types are the same indoors as outdoors, and in the same uh, frequency, um, if you have a list of, of, if you rank the, the spore types as far as abundance and the rankings are the same, then you would say there's nothing uh, going on in the indoor environment. And if they're very different, um, there may be something going on in the indoor environment. And this is a difficult method also um, for a variety of reasons. Neither of these two methods work on their own. So how can we make them work? In the first place, you must use indoor-outdoor ratios for each individual spore type. Total ratios between total counts indoors and total counts outdoors are not generally useful. Somehow, once you get your indoor-outdoor ratios, then you still have to interpret them. I've made a few examples uh, to help illustrate this. In this one, the indoor-outdoor indoor -outdoor ratio for totals is 0.26. That's really very low, and you would consider the indoor environment not to be a problem. However, if you actually look at the data, you'll see that Clytosporium and Penicillium aspergillus type spores uh, have ratios close to one. Now, is this a problem or not? It may be. Uh, the, uh, there's really no difference between 5,000 and 7,000 Clytosporium spores, so you don't really know what the ratio is. It's, it's one, essentially one, 
um, but you, you don't know which way it actually goes. This ratio is based on relatively low numbers, and statistically speaking, numbers of uh, actual spore counts below 10 are, are, not, are, are subject to a great deal of error. So that 0.88 is not a very reliable indicator of whether or not you have indoor contamination. So just in this very, what looks to be a straightforward indoor-outdoor ratio problem, we find, um, it question, we find several different problems. In this example, uh, Cladosporium and Penicillium and Stachybotrys all have um, ratios greater than one, which would indicate a problem, but the total ratio is less than one, which would not indicate a problem. Now this is another, uh, this emphasizes again the fact that you must use individual taxon um, ratios. In this case, uh, Cladosporium, the, the levels aren't really that different. 1,000 to 700 is not a strong difference with respect to the fungi. The populations tend to vary geometrically, and so you would really like to see 10,000 versus 700, not 1,000. So in actuality, 1,000 and 700 are not different um, statistically with respect to fungal aerosols. With penicillium and aspergillus, the levels are equal indoors and out, and the levels are low. So in this case, you'd have to um, look at how many spores were counted, actually counted, and how those numbers were derived to decide whether the, that number is relevant. And then finally, we have stachybotrys. We have 30 indoors and 20 outdoors, uh, giving a ratio of 1.5. Well, you know, that may be that stachybotrys is growing indoors. These are very, very low concentrations, so you probably would not want to, um, to say that this is a badly contaminated environment based on those numbers. Now in this case, we've done culture sampling and a combination of culture sampling and spore trap sampling. And so we have relatively low ratios for the penicillium and um, for the cladosporium and the um, penicillium aspergillus spores. And that's the same data as in the previous slide. However, we've now added the cultural data, which says that that penicillium aspergillus indoors was aspergillus sedoi and outdoors was aspergillus fumigatus. You have aspergillus sedoi in levels of 350 indoors and zero outdoors. Well, that is a ratio that you cannot interpret. You can't divide zero into 350. It just doesn't work. And then you have aspergillus fumigatus in the opposite direction, so you have the, a ratio of zero. So again, you can't interpret, you can't rely on indoor-outdoor ratios to tell you the whole story, especially if you're using uh, spore traps for your sampling um, method. Now, you can do everything that I did, everything that I said for those examples, you can do yourself if you know the ecology of each of these different fungi. It took me a long time to learn that. Uh, but you can. Anybody can do it. Um, I have no special cells in my brain that tell me that give me that um, that privilege. You can also just decide for yourself um, what overall uh, constitutes an important indoor-outdoor ratio for each taxon. Now, in my opinion, that should be a different number for each of the different um, taxa because. They have different um, ecologies, and some, sometimes they're high out. Some of them are very high outdoors, and some of them are always very low outdoors. But um, you can do that, and some people do. That is one of the one of the ways that um, these data are commonly interpreted. However, we have developed the mold score, which uses an aerobiological approach uh, to interpreting indoor-outdoor ratios, and this approach is essentially patterned after the approach I used, um, in other words, a professional aerobiologist's approach to interpreting these indoor-outdoor ratios. We tested the mold score against the opinion of experts, and then we continually reevaluate uh, and update the algorithms. We have compared the mold score with the opinions of um, our group of experts, and we used 100 uh, reports that that were submitted uh, by our clients. And we have a correlation between the mold score and our expert opinions. Now these people are, have lots of experience in doing this, as much experience as I do, and I was one of the experts. And we have a very, very strong correlation between um, the expert opinions and the mold score. Our experts have cumulative experience in aerobiology totaling more than 100 years. 
we used this cumulative experience to develop and verify the mold score. And we believe it to be the best and most reliable method for interpreting indoor-outdoor comparison data. This cumulative experience was used to develop and verify the mold score. Now, this was done by having a statistician sit there with each of us and ask us questions about how we would interpret specific numbers that, that were found on, uh, on various reports. And we did this over and over and over again. And then we, the group of experts got together and discussed why, we, why there were differences between our um, interpretations. And we came to a consensus about what was really going on, and all of these factors were put into the mold score. We believe the mold score to be the most reliable method available to interpret indoor-outdoor comparison data. It's the only method that allows access to the experts in the field, the real experts in the field. Now, how should the mold score be used? It certainly should never be used on its own. You can't just send in a couple of samples and get the mold score back and say, aha, I have a contaminated environment. It's only to be used as an adjunct to a thorough, expertly performed investigation. And it should only be used as a second opinion following your own interpretation of the data. In other words, you take all the data that you have, excluding the mold score, develop your own interpretation, and then look at the mold score as a check, as a final check on your interpretation. If the you and the mold score disagree, then you don't need to immediately say, oh, the mold score must be right. You go back and you look at all the data again, and you, if necessary, look at the environment again, and then make a decision based on your professional judgment. The mold score is just an adjunct to this, um, to this decision. And finally, sampling only when the sampling is required to meet your client's needs. Uh, this is not an, an answer. This is not the final answer for interpreting data. You cannot go out into a, into a residence and take one sample indoors and one sample outdoors and look at that mold score and say, okay, there's a problem here. It doesn't work that way. Only use this in conjunction with your own experience, own professional experience. So, to repeat, mold score should never be used as the only indication of the status of an indoor environment. It is never a substitute for the judgment of a qualified professional. Expert opinion always trumps the mold score. If you see fungi or water damage, there is a problem regardless of what air sampling data indicate. Air sampling data is often, often produces false negative data. If you've done a thorough investigation and have found nothing, the mold score is either wrong. If it's high, the mold score is either wrong or it may indicate a hidden source and may uh, lead you to go back to the environment and look again. You need, to make, you, you need to use your own judgment to make this particular decision. In the hands of a qualified professional, the mold score can be an extremely useful tool. If you would like to evaluate our 100 control data sets, we would welcome your input. Thank you.